One of the things I think is just this idea that I've been talking or thinking about a lot is just about how bikes uh, lead to more connection. And that really like as humans, like we need to be connected. And, um, and you think about like other societies that have implemented bikes as a form of transportation. And it seems as though people are a lot happier. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm your host, John Zimmerman, and that was Chris Nolte of the Propel YouTube channel and Propel Bikes, a bi-coastal electric assist and e-cargo bike shop company with three locations, uh, Brooklyn, New York, Long Beach, California, and now in Wilmington, Delaware as well. As you'll soon learn from this discussion I had with Chris a few weeks ago, he is motivated by a passion to provide people, especially families, with the freedom and empowerment that comes from living a life that's a little less encumbered by car dependency. We cover a lot of ground and talk a fair amount about how his experience visiting other places, such as the Netherlands, has helped him shape his storytelling direction of his YouTube channel. Thank you so very much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Chris Nolte. Chris Nolte with Propel and Propel Bikes. Chris, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Hey, so you have been one of my most requested <laughs> guests to be on the podcast. So I'm incredibly grateful that you're able to do this. Uh, you wear several different hats, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. But why don't you just give a quick uh, overview, thumbnail sketch of, of who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess I've been into bikes for a really long time, but I got into electric bikes in 2011. I actually started a e-bike shop in New York, um, which I still have, and I've opened a couple others uh, selling electric bikes. And and then I have uh, a YouTube channel that I started in 2018, and um, we make videos about bikes. And more recently, been making uh, kind of getting more into the active transportation space, and you know learning more about infrastructure and stuff like that. It's interesting because I kind of just happen upon this sort of experience. Um, but, um, you know, so it's, it's interesting to be amongst like more academics and that sort of stuff that are like really studying this. I'm just like, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. Like, tell me more. What's this about? You know, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been, it's been great watching your stuff as well. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I thought it would be fun to uh, actually queue up and play your what is Propel video. It's not very long. It's like only only three minutes long. And I thought that would actually be a nice way to introduce the audience to, uh, you know, as as a brief thumbnail uh, to your, your organization and, and what this is all about. And 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 just also to to mention to the audience that there's a much deeper, <laughs> really cool video that you just put out that really gives a, a, a really rich history of Propel and, and yourself in, in terms of your journey of getting here. So let's, uh, let's queue up this, this particular video because I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice way to you know, introduce uh, you, know, you, the concept, and, uh, and what Propel is all about in, in all its different uh, phases. And this is actually your, um, this is actually your uh, you know, YouTube channel of Propel. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and cue this guy up. Hey guys, my name is Chris Nolte, and I'm the founder of Propel. Propel is an electric bike shop, and we have two stores, one in Brooklyn, New York, and another in Long Beach, California. And we also work with people all over the country. Now, I started this channel because I wanted to share some of the various experiences I'm having in the electric bike industry, show some of the really cool products that we get to see, and just as an opportunity to kind of build a sense of community and connect with people on a deeper level. I think that video really affords us this opportunity to communicate in a way that I can't really do via phone or email or sometimes even in the store if I don't have as much time. So far we've created many videos on different bike reviews, just showing some of the different products that are coming out and we plan to do many more of them. But we've also showed a deeper look at some of the companies that we work with. 
whether it be Risa Mueller or Gazelle or Urban Arrow, and we'll be showing many more brands as well as time goes on. I think this is a better way for people to understand the companies behind these really amazing products. I feel like we're just at this really interesting time in the industry at the moment, and I think there's not always such an opportunity to be able to tell the startings of an industry or show how all these things come about, but that's really my hope for this to serve as that sort of purpose. And we've been able to do a lot of that so far, telling a lot of the stories of the different companies, but also really telling the stories of people that ride the bikes and how they're impacting them on their daily lives. I mean, for me, I get really inspired when I see other people riding the bikes and see how they use them in their lives. And I think it helps people to understand in more tangible ways how the bikes can be used, that they're not just a toy, that they can actually be used as a car replacement and they can really have a dramatic impact on the way that people live. Beyond showing how the products are used, we also want to just show a little bit deeper in how the technology works. The technology is a little bit complex at times and I really hope that these videos can serve as a way to explain it on a little bit of a deeper level. And beyond that, we're also going to do some different updates. We went to Eurobike earlier this year and we're able to show a lot of the new innovations that different companies are introducing. But ultimately, I want to hear more from you guys. I want to hear what would you like to see more of. And, and I have to say that I really appreciate everybody that's commented so far and liked and shared the videos. I usually don't ask for that in the videos because I think it's kind of tacky at times, but I want to say that I do really appreciate for those of you that have been commenting, liking, and sharing, and all that sort of stuff. So please keep on doing that. and. Just let me know, like, what do you want to see more of? In the coming months, we'll be doing more bike reviews, a lot more of the rider stories, and a lot of tech tips. I really want to support the people that have the bikes already and make sure that we're able to provide reliable information on how to use the bikes, how to maintain them, and how to enjoy it, really. So I look forward to seeing you in future videos, and I'll see you soon. I love it. <laughs> I wanted to share that because there was a couple things that, that were just really profound that, that I loved about that little short little video is that one, um, it, it did a great job of just kind of, you know, talking about the fact that you, you are wearing so many different hats. You're, you're a content creator, you're pushing stuff out. You've got like, you know, almost 36,000 subscribers on your channel already. How long has the channel been going? Uh, we started in the summer of 2019. So yeah, wow, just, just, yeah, I, uh, that's it, that's like a rocket ship for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite perfect. Jason Slaughter standards, you know, who really went you know bonkers. He just uh, made it over the half million mark at this point. Uh, you know, talk about catching a, a tiger by the tail, but. I mean, could you have imagined? I mean, just you know, just three short years ago, in 2019, um, obviously COVID had something to do with it because many more people were like turning to uh, to YouTube and 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 you know trying to absorb a lot of content. Not to mention the fact that you know even myself, same thing. Uh, that's the history behind the podcast. Is I started it because of COVID. I wasn't able to be out filming my documentary, which I've been working on for the past five years so much. So I had to do something. Um, but talk a little bit about that because it, it seems like that was a huge shift or, or transition to towards becoming more of a content creator. Yeah, it, it was a big deal. Um, I mean, I made a pretty significant investment. I, I hired a full-time videographer, so that was a really big deal. I, I had some prior experience uh, making videos with a friend of mine, uh, another great YouTube channel called Electric Bike Review. And I just realized that there's like more stories that I wanted to tell. There's things that I was seeing, experiences that I was having that I wanted to share. And, you know, I want to invest more in that. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure I knew exactly what would happen, but I knew that it would provide value. And I felt like that was like the main thing I wanted to to focus on. Um, because for me, like I, I, I wanted to, you know, know more about these things. And, and, and really since then, it's been pretty amazing. Like the people that I've gotten to meet as a result of, you know, just doing this thing. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. I mean, and, and just, you know, even to be here with you, 
you know, I don't know that it would happen otherwise. And so it's kind of like investing that. And, and I guess it's not necessarily just video, but it's like, you know, just providing value. I think that it's like doing something, you know, contributing something positive. And I think early on for me, the, the mission behind Propel was to help change the way that we move and like get around and help to lessen our dependence on, you know, oil and that sort of thing. And, and what I recognize is that the videos have the potential to do that, perhaps at even a greater extent than we can with our shops. And um, I still have loads of passion behind that, the, the shops and, and what we do there. But, you know, it's interesting how, you know, how those different things can have a, a big impact. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, and, and it's, you're, you're the only person I can think of that really, you know, has that, you know, kind of two-sided approach in terms of you've, you literally have brick and mortar stores, <laughs> you know, by coastal, uh, to boot and, uh, and, and more power to you too. I mean, you know, you, it, it was very, very Spartan times in the beginning. And again, folks, you, you've got to check out yeah. that history video, uh, you know, of, of, of that, evolution of the, con the, 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 the company itself, but then being in the right place at the right time with, um, the electric assist, you know, cargo bike, uh, you know, whole thing coming together and, um, you know, being dedicated to, you know, some of the top brands, the highest quality brands, you know, in that market, um, you know, gosh, who, who would have thunk it, you know, and then at the same time, you know, really, um, strategizing and then, and then also having the, this, you know, content creation side of it. So talk a little bit about that, that marriage between the two, cause they are kind of feeding off each other. They are. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you look at it that way. I mean, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it's certainly for me, um, it's a lot about strategy. Um, especially considering when I started out, this was a failing business model, you know, like I was selling electric bikes in a place where they were considered illegal. So, um, you know, the idea that I'm going to make it, <laughs> and I have to, and I, have to I have to laugh because that's exactly the title of the, of the video. So <laughs> you were, you were literally selling electric bikes in the state of New York and electric bikes at the time were illegal. So. Yeah. And, and I guess you said like, who would have thought it? And it's like, well, I did, I, I believed it. I, I knew that it was possible. I knew what was going to basically happen because, you know, as people say, like history repeats itself and nothing's really new. So if you look at Europe and, and Asia and these different places where electric bikes had already, you know, started to become pretty prominent. So, well, surely that's likely to happen here, maybe not as quickly and maybe not necessarily in the places that are so dependent on cars, but eventually. And, um, and I, and I, you know, figured New York is one of those places that had the most to gain in relation to that. So I said, well, you know, I guess like early on, instead of just focusing on like just selling bikes, I try to focus on like really understanding the market and really focusing on developing relationships with the best products and brands in the world. And I traveled quite a bit to do that. I went to Germany pretty much every year to the Eurobike show. Um, and, you know, it's fortunate through that, through that experience. I mean, you know, I'm sure a lot of them look at me like I'm crazy as maybe they still do today to some extent, but um you know, I think we need to, we need those crazy ideas sometimes, you know, and, um, and then basically what I recognize is that, okay, well, this is still a new thing and everybody needs to be educated about this. Like people don't know. So what's now I can do this as I had been doing it on an individual basis in my shop, or I can make videos about it and share it with thousands of people, you know, on the internet. And I should, you know, note that that's really my background is more like with the web and with technology and, and really the power that that brings. And, um, yeah, so I, I really leaned into that. I said, Hey, this, this is the, this is the bigger problem we need to solve now. It's like, okay, now people are starting to become aware of them, but how can they be smart about their decisions and, and make more sustainable choices and like, you know, um, and, and really getting a product that, that will work for them longer term. I mean, that was kind of the goal in, yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it is interesting too, because when, when you think about the, the power of the electric assist bike and the power of the electric assist cargo bike, um, 
it really starts to level the playing field and and make the possibility of leaving that car behind that much more frequently, maybe even reducing the number of cars in the household to a one car family or a zero car family if you get really bold and and are in a situation where your infrastructure and your environment is conducive to that. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is a profound game changer for many households. And so you're only scratching the surface with just two shops and, you know, the, the beginning, because when we look at what is possible across the country, across the continent, around the world, uh, there is so much that could be happening and so much growth. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, like you say, that's the thing for the many families. But actually, if you think about it, it's actually the majority of families. The majority of families don't ride bikes. The majority of people don't ride bikes. And and what I recognize is that it's not just like a physical limitation that people might have. It's a lot of times like a perceived limitation that people feel, you know, emotionally limited. They're like, well, or psychologically, they're like, well, I'm not, I'm concerned if I'm going to be able to keep up with my friends or, or there's a hill and people don't know how to shift gears. So like, you know, and, and electric assist kind of solves a lot of that. So it gets that other like 90% of people out on bikes or, or at least gives that possibility uh, more easily to that, that group. And so that's one of the things that I'm particularly excited about and, and seeing that potential for sure. Obviously we need many other things, you know, uh, infrastructure is certainly a critical piece and that's something that it's been interesting to kind of get an education myself, but, but, you know, I, as I use this phrase a lot, like learning in public, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do a lot in my channel is kind of learn in public, like learn from these, you know, different titans in this uh, industry of like, you know, Hey, what, what are the best practices? What are the things that you're learning and like share it with me and like on camera and we can share it with the world. And, um, and, and that's, uh, that's been a really nice experience because I, I don't come from that space of like having any sort of academic background in it. Um, I, I'm also happen to be dyslexic. So reading things is not the easiest thing, but, you know, communicating and, 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 and receiving information through written, I mean, through audio and video forms, definitely uh, a lot easier for me. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> it's funny too, because you, uh, you, you blend in a lot of good comedy with your, uh, with the, in humor, with your, uh, your, your videos. And so, uh, including, you know, some, some kind of deep little outtakes and the fact that, you know, little mishaps might happen, but you leave them in there. I love it. It's just, it, it's so human. It, it really makes, uh, it makes me smile. You're smiling right now because you know mm-hmm. that it's like, yeah, I'm just a guy trying to, to you know, tell a story here. So I, I, I pulled up, go ahead and comment on that a little bit. And then I'm going to, we'll talk about your website here in a second. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I mean that, I, I think that we need to do that. I think people crave that. I think people crave like the more human interaction experience that people just being real. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we need to do that. We need to show that, you know, and, and, um, I don't know, like, yeah, even when I fell off the bike or things like that, it's just, it's, it's hilarious. And, and, you know, life is funny. Um, you know, so let's, let's not be too serious about it, but I guess it's a part of it too, where I think, I guess, you know, you spoke about not just bikes, for example, it's like, well, how many people are out there like sharing, like kind of similar information from a, like a more, you know, academic perspective, but, but to share it, it's really all, a lot about like how it's packaged and who can receive this information and, and can we listen? Because um, I think a lot of times we can feel like we're, you know, speaking to the choir and, and, and I think that's a, that's a challenge that we definitely need to address in this industry, um, you know, and because it, it's really like, okay, are we going to be effective? And, uh, and I really try pretty hard to be effective in what we do. And I think yeah. that that's an important thing to consider. Yeah. So I pulled up your website and the reason why I wanted to pull up the, the, the bike web sh- website here is uh, I, I'm going to pause on this particular image right off the bat because I think this is the, you know, the image that um, when we think of the power that electric cargo bikes and electric assist bikes can have, I mean, this is it. You mentioned it earlier, the, the fact that 
almost every household in the United States, in North America, cities around the globe, it, it, it could be a little bit more like this. There could be an opportunity for families to be able to get more meaningful trips and more meaningful destinations in. And, and you know, I think that this is the, you know, part of the power of what even this image, you know, helps to show. Talk a little bit about that, that um, orientation of the org, of the company, of the organization, of the store, um, of, you know, being solution providers, because you're not just hawking product. Right. Well, I think that that's the thing. I think, so there's a couple of things with that. I think, uh, one, I saw it as an opportunity to, one, one, I saw it as a necessity to kind of change people's thoughts about these products. I mean, you know, if you think about electric bikes, they tend to be uh, considerably more expensive than a non-electric bike. And especially ones, you know, especially for, for many people, the bikes that they might be familiar with, and they might not necessarily understand the costs that come into them. So I think presenting them in a different way and getting people to think and understand that this is not just a bicycle and that we need to think about it differently. And and really just looking to like, how can this product like solve someone's problem? Um, you know, because sometimes people might say like, oh, well, you could buy a used car for that much. And it's like, well, in a busy city with no parking, would you rather have a used car or a really good electric bike? You know, it's like, well, what's what's a better value? Like what what what's a smarter decision? And um, and I think many people have made that that smart decision and, and invested in an electric bike and, and and it's it's worked well for them. It's not for everybody though. And I think we're that's the other thing. Like we I I really don't like the idea of like selling things. I I, I think that it should be more that idea of like providing solutions, like helping people to understand if something's a right fit or not. Right. Um, And I think that this is like the new age of commerce and that I think consumers want that. Um, I want that as a consumer. I don't want to be sold to, I want uh, to be educated. Um, And, and if you think about it, like the web, how do we browse the web? We kind of like, click in and out of things and you just go like do a bunch of research and then we, you know, like try to make some decisions based on that. And so I try to create my business in such a way that it's, you know, in, in a similar fashion where it's more educational and whether or not somebody chooses to buy a bike from us, it's like, it's really like, okay, are we fulfilling our mission? Are we providing value in, in this market, you know, by doing that? And, and, you know, I think as, as long as we can continue to do that, then, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to exist, you know, um, because if we provide value, there's opportunities to, you know, receive value in return. Um, so that's that's one of the key things that I've learned. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I'll, I'll just scroll down a little bit here and, and take a look at this and and see. And again, you know, even even the title here, you know, explore the e, e-bikes that made the cut. I, I, again, you're really being choosy about which um, which products that you are, are choosing to have out there, you know, on the showroom floor. Um, and and I, you mentioned online sales, too. And I, I saw a couple of uh, testimonials from from places like Hawaii. I used to live in Hawaii before moving here to Austin. Um, so it sounds like you, you can actually you know, supply somebody with a, a, a quality bike um, in a market where they may not have a, a locally owned store. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, particularly when I started out, there was less and less shops around. I mean, they started you know, over 10 years ago and, you know, uh, there, there weren't too many shops for quality bikes and now it's growing and, and, uh, but I think they will still continue to be, uh, places that are not well served by, uh, electric bike shops. And, and we're happy to fill that, that need. And, um, again, it's like, can we be effective? You know, where, where can we, you know, best provide value and, and, and thinking about some of these unique things, particularly when I started out. I mean, part of the reason why that was the case is uh, one, I had background in e-commerce, but two, one of the really big things was um, that electric bikes were largely illegal in New York. So we are actually not, we sold the majority of bikes that we sold were outside of our local market. Um, and uh, now New York is definitely changing quite a bit, but, but starting out, it was dramatically different. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, I did want to pause on this particular image here um, just because it, it, it also helps to exemplify the sort of the difference um, when, we're, when we're looking at the, these, um, eh, didn't want to actually do that. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Go. Go away. Thank you. Um, the reason why I wanted to pause on this is, is that um, there's a difference between, you know, even how these bikes look. I mean, these are high comfort bikes. That's exactly what this category is con considered. It's, you know, comfort and cruising. And I had a, a, a comment literally come through on one of my videos um, this morning. Uh, somebody from the Netherlands saying, why is it, you know, none of the bikes in that video uh, of those open streets events in Portland, uh, Fort Collins and Tucson had fenders and, and mud flaps and all these things. And uh, one of the, the comment that I made back or the response that I made back is that, yeah, I mean, that's one of the one of the challenges is that bikes in North America are oftentimes sold without what I would consider, you know, like the, the key essentials, you know, um, Chris and Melissa Bruntlett, you know, talk about it of, of having a complete bike and not feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to do all these additional add-ons and, and extras when, when you pick up a bike, a gazelle, for instance, in, in the Netherlands, it's pretty much got everything on it. It's a complete bike. You're not having to piece the bike together. Talk a little bit about that from the standpoint of, uh, of a shop owner, because in North America, that's traditionally the way bikes have been sold. They haven't been complete. Yeah, the, the unfortunate reality is that most e-bikes, I mean, or really most bikes in the U.S. historically been sold for sport or recreation. And the whole like utility biking or biking for transportation hasn't really been so recognized as a, as a major market. Uh, that's been changing quite a bit. Um, but historically, from my side, we mostly look to Europe to find the products that are already meeting those needs in that way, that are already um, set up as complete bikes that have fenders, rack, lights, et cetera. And, um, yeah, why, why would you not? I mean, unless it's a mountain bike, but even still, like actually what we found is that even like on the mountain bike side, a lot of people, they're not necessarily going mountain biking. They want to be able to ride on the street and ride some dirt roads, ride some light off-road stuff. And um, so I really like this idea of kind of like an all-purpose bike. And if you think about it, uh, particularly with electric bikes, when you're investing a, a significant amount of money in purchasing one, you want to be able to do more with it, go more places, and and to have a bike that's kind of set up um, to be able to handle a more variety of events uh, can can go a long way. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to pull up the uh, the cargo bike uh, uh, page here, and um, I, I have to say that uh, I've been a huge fan of of cargo bikes ever since I started, uh, um, you know, traveling to, to Europe and spending time in the Netherlands and, and, you know, saw my first Bach feats, you know, uh, many, many years ago. And then, um, uh, more recent trips, seeing more and more urban arrows out there. I haven't seen as many of the, the recent Mueller's, obviously it's a, a German brand. Um, and, uh, to your point, the, the pricing of these, you know, might scare people off at first blush and first glance, but you mentioned it earlier. This is really, it, it's don't compare this to a bike, compare this to the fact that this has the potential utilitarian value of a, an automobile. And so, you know, Sneezing at a, a ten thousand dollar you know cargo bike that has the potential of being a a, a an SUV <laughs> that is pedal powered and a, a little electric assist on there, it, it, it changes the context. We're having a, a different discussion altogether. Yeah, it's definitely um, outside of what people normally think of or or expect. Um, but if you think about it, I mean, it, these, these conversations come up quite a bit, but, but if you think about it, um, you know, they have very different constraints to work within, you know, if, if say, for example, if you didn't want to pedal it, you can make the bike a lot cheaper. If you right. didn't want it to be, you know, very maneuverable, then yeah, it's like whatever, or, or how about like certain elements that might improve the safety or the comfort, like suspension, for example. Right. Um, really. Can we pause deal. on that for just a second? 
Yeah. So, uh, and it's funny that you mentioned suspension because, uh, you know, uh, we're recording this on, um, on February 15th and later this week, the uh, episode with Tatiana uh, Saldi's Lust is going to be there and uh, they have an Urban Arrow. Uh, she and Brandon have an Urban Arrow. And it comes up in the in the conversation. It comes up in, in a little video clip of where she's like, I think this needs suspension. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I hadn't thought about suspension. But then watching your that short little video that we watched uh, in the beginning, that little uh, that little three minute clip, you could see that the Reese and Mueller has a, a bit of suspension to to that. So even that is being thought about. So, yeah, I mean it's these little fine tuning aspects of, of something as simple as a bike and then take it to the next level of a cargo carrying bike and the, the empowerment that comes along with that. And, and then also fine tuning, making it a little bit, making that ride a little bit smoother. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's important to recognize that we're still in pretty the early, we're kind of in the early days, you know, we're, we're a little bit beyond the Model T if we're going to go in that direction, uh, using maybe a bad analogy. But, um, you know, it's uh, but, you know, there's certain elements and, 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 I'm, and I'm really fortunate to be able to work with brands that are just very forward thinking. They're not just like copying what everybody else is doing, because there's plenty of companies that are just like following. But but there's many companies that are really leading out in this and they say like, hey, you know, we really believe in this movement. We're going to just really create the best product. And, and I think, you know, there's two different schools of thought. It's like, okay, how can we solve this problem for the least amount of money as possible? And then there's the other school of thought is like, how can we figure out the, you know, the best solution to this problem? And for me, I want to work with the companies that are looking to, you know, find the best solution to this problem. Um, I, I don't have anything against the ones that are finding the cheapest way to do it. It's just not, it not necessarily congruent with, you know, my business model. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, overall more people on bikes, the better, uh, safety does become a little bit of a concern at a certain point, but outside of that, um, you know, I think it's all good. Okay. So you just mentioned safety. So let's, uh, you know, really address the elephant in the room is, is the fact of getting back to infrastructure. And as you sort of moved along your journey as a content creator, starting in 2019, and, uh, I'm assuming in the early days you were really focused on, you know, the, the e-bike, uh, technology and the education. When did you start to make that move over to thinking about, well, gosh, if, if this is all going to be successful, truly successful in North America, other cities around the world, we need to have better infrastructure. When did that sort of start percolating for you? Well, I guess what it is, is like eventually you just start to hit barriers. You're like, okay, yeah. what is the barrier that I'm faced right here? You know, okay, well, you know what? A place like LA could be great for biking, but unfortunately the infrastructure kind of stinks and yeah. it's not really the safest place to ride. So um, we need to solve that. If we, you know, it's not a matter of just putting more product out on the street. It's a matter of like actually making people feel comfortable to do it. Um, and, and I think that's something I've been fortunate to learn from, from other people. I don't know that it's necessarily original idea. I mean, it's just certainly something I've learned from, from watching and listening to other people where it's like, well, if you build it, they will come. And, and I really truly, truly believe that. And, and again, it's like, if my mission really is to get more people out on bikes and really help people change the way they think about they get, how they get around, uh, that's the way to do it. And, um, and I think it's for me, I think overall, uh, I really believe in this idea that like, it, uh, if you can help people, but if you, if you can't at least like don't hurt people. Um, and like, that's like, that almost like the meaning of life to some extent, like the way that we should try to live our lives. And I, I just try to find ways to be helpful. And, and if I can provide like, a, you know, help in a greater good, and I guess these days I'm thinking about like more so like what we need as a society, like what cities need. And I think of the potential of bikes to solve that. And 
and, you know, and how all these other pieces fit into that equation, you know, whether it be infrastructure, et cetera, and, you know, how we connect with each other, how we interact with each other. And, and, and really it's been, you know, it's just a tremendous opportunity to get to learn and study some of these other cultures that have effectively integrated this. And they seem to be largely happy and healthy as a result of that. So uh, I think we all want that. And um, that's, that's a better goal than say like, okay, let's just not use uh, so much foreign oil. Let's try not to go to war. I mean, certainly I don't want that. I've, I've been to war. I don't want to do that again. Right. Uh, I won't recommend it. Um, but yeah. So yeah. <laughs> what has been your, your biggest, most profound learning, you know, in that context, in that area of going out and exploring these, these other environments and, and, kind of dipping your, your toe into this world of, of, of advocacy and, and infrastructure. What's, what's been the most profound thing that you, you have come away with? Well, I will say um, most people don't bike, not because they don't like biking or because they don't want to bike. Most people don't bike because they don't feel safe or comfortable. And infrastructure can solve that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. That most people don't understand that. They, you know, think that, oh, yeah, well, you know, people don't want to do that. They don't want to bike. But I don't think that that's true. Um, and I'd say that's probably one of the biggest ones. Because I think if, if more people understand that simple fact that, like, actually, if you have a safe place for people to ride, they'll get out on their bikes. And I think it's been proven during the pandemic. We've seen it many times. Um, in, in many places as the, you know, more space is available for people to bike safely, you start to see people pulling their bikes out of the garage and that sort of stuff. So, um, I, yeah, I would, I would really like to see more of that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier, um, that you hired a, a, a videographer, somebody to really help you with that production side of things. Uh, who is your partner in crime with that? Oh, yes. So her name is Tara Salveson. Mm -hmm. um, so she's originally from New Jersey, but she lives in Long Beach. And yeah, we've been working together since uh, since uh, I guess I think it was July of 2019. And it was kind of a wild ride. I mean, she came on board with me. We started making videos. We threw most of the first ones out. It was interesting because we had to like relearn a lot of things. I mean, she's formally trained as a I guess a cinematographer, documentarian. She's like, you know, she had made some documentaries, and um, and I was interested in finding somebody that could like help do it all, sort of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, within a month or two, we were in Germany. Then shortly thereafter, we were in the Netherlands, and we were just like doing our thing. And then COVID hit, and things got interesting. But um, but. Yeah, I was just really grateful. She kind of just rolled with it with me, and and um, and it's been it's been a really great ride. And now we're focused uh, quite a bit on just like telling people stories, um, which has been a, a lot of fun. And I think it's probably getting a little bit more into like the type of work that she you know initially set out you know in school and stuff to do. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's really nice. It's uh, I, I definitely couldn't do it on my own. Uh, I get a lot of credit for it, but it's definitely, yeah, yeah. it's, it's not all me. So is she doing the editing as well? She does. Yeah. 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 So she's doing that, all that production side of it. And she's a good sport <laughs> because, you know, she's frequently and, and folks, you, if you haven't checked out the channel, you've got to check it out. And Tara, uh, you know, is typically, you know, behind the camera filming, but occasionally, uh, you know, things, you know, shift around and, and she's a good sport because she's also frequently, um, you know, you know, in, in a situation where she's, uh, you know, doing this, doing that, uh, things happen and, and again, get going back to some of the, the little, uh, mishaps that kind of have, you know, come along and, and it seems like she's a good sport and, uh, it's, there's a lot of personality yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and then there's a lot of trust too. I mean, the majority yes. of our yeah. filming is actually her sitting in the front of a cargo bike, uh, yes. filming me, sometimes filming other people. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that she trusts me. I and mean, I don't know if she has so much reason to after I dropped her, uh, more than once, but, uh, but we, we, we do it at a slow speed and, uh, yeah, fortunately no one's gotten hurt so far. So, 
Well, it was fun too, because in your uh, biking in Amsterdam is an uh, intimidating video. She, she gets to pilot a little bit and, and, and try to, you know, get, get a sense as to what it's like to, you know, be out there on the busy streets, uh, you know, in a car, you know, pi- piloting a cargo bike, which is, you know, not yeah, the easiest like, of things, but yes. It's not the easiest. I'm, I'm definitely significantly heavier than her. So that, that that's a factor as well. Yeah. Uh, it's e- easier on my side, but. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Well, again, I, I encourage everybody, you know, please do check out, um, you know, those, those videos. Um, they're incredibly moving in, in a, in, in a variety of different ways. And I really look forward to, to those profiles because that storytelling aspect of really getting to the heart of, uh, you know, of that, this is possible. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier before, you know, Tatiana's uh, story of, of, you know, relearning how to ride a bike and, you know, literally as adult, you know, not knowing how to ride a bike and, you know, Brandon helping her and relearning how to ride a bike. And then, you know, fast forward, you know, five, six years, and now they mostly ride bikes. They hardly ever drive a car and, uh, you know, in, in living a, a much, much richer, much different lifestyle of being able to, to use that, uh, electric assist, you know, cargo bike, um, to be able to make meaningful trips all around their city. So, I mean, these are, these are important stories to be able to tell because it gives hope and, um, and gives people a feeling that, you know, Hey, I can, I, I can do this. I, you know, I can re- you know, relate to that person. Uh, do you have any, any stories that, uh, you know, come to mind that you think would, uh, that, you know, you'd like to highlight right now that are coming up soon? Um, I do. I do have a story. I wanted to share one thing though, because you asked about like one of the more profound things that I've heard. And, yeah. and I know that, you know, we, we're, we're both in America and a lot of people like question, like why the Netherlands is the way it is and America is this way. And one of the interesting things I learned in researching that is that actually a lot of the same things that had turned the Netherlands into more of a biking city um, or biking country, I should say, uh, was, you know, basically people speaking out about it, you know, really uh, protesting, et cetera. And to my understanding, that actually was going on in America around the same time, but it didn't actually get uh, the same level of um, media play, I guess, if you will. It did on more of a local level, but not on a national level. And so I think that's one of the key things that needs to happen is like, we need to tell these stories on a national level and we can't be beholden to any particular like company or whatever, like, you know, it just, it needs to be purely that, Hey, this is a good idea and we want to support it. Um, And so really that's, that's part of my hope. Um, and, And that's why I've been leaning more in the direction of telling these stories. Uh, one of the ones that I'm most excited about coming up uh, is uh, John uh, Bauders. Uh, he's the mayor of Emeryville. And I've never met him before. Uh, I mean, this is the power of the internet. I was like, you know, he's going crazy on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter that much. Again, as I said, I'm dyslexic, so I'm not like a you know, voracious reader. But he's like, hey, I want to like film by bike. And people and a couple of people said, like, you should talk to Propel. And I was like, oh, like this guy's interesting. So yeah, we've been messaging back and forth. And I was like, well, I'm going to California. I was like, I'm just going to come up there and we're just going to do this. We got to do it. So um, for those of you who don't know, the mayor of Emeryville, super into bikes, super supportive of bike infrastructure and and just doing amazing things. And, and I guess this is just another person that's like led by his passion um, and, and, and he has a clear passion to like do good. And, and I think that that moves you, you know, and I think that people support that. I think generally people want to support good things. And, and it seems like he's doing a lot of good things. I, I look forward to learning more about it. I mean, I've, I've been researching um, and uh, yeah. And, and I just, I've, I've had a lot of fun ones in the Netherlands recently, more, more, more specifically, but it's really my hope actually that I can end up doing like, say like the mayor of New York or like the mayor of Paris or, or Pete, booty gay or whoever, you know, and, and am I the right person to do it? Like, you know, again, not having any formal background on it, maybe not, uh, but maybe in a lot of ways, yes, because like, I don't know this stuff and I just want to learn it from like the same perspective as like the average person, you know, 
And so that's, that's kind of the way I'm approaching it. And, and, and that's like, that's my new mission, if you will, with this, you know, channel and and the direction I'm trying to go with, with it. And, and, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about it. It's been a lot of fun and, yeah. yeah, I love it. I, 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 you know, it's sometimes being the quote unquote expert, you know, gets in the way, you know, it's like I've, I have 30 years experience in, in the behavior side of, of health promotion and disease prevention. And, and my mind is like always working in these areas. But when I see, uh, you know, content that is created by somebody like yourself, and it's just like, it's so, it's so authentic, it's, it's human. And, and, and you're very transparent about the fact that, I, I don't know everything there is to know about all these things. And I'm not studying this stuff from an academic perspective. Um, and you're, you're thirsty to learn. And, and that's what's so amazing about it. And, and, uh, and I think that speaks in terms of, you know, the growth that you have seen in your channel and uh, hopefully continued growth uh, w- within the e-bike business as well. Um, so you're bike coastal at this point with the shop. Uh, any plans on uh, building a shop, uh, you know, maybe here in Austin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't reveal all our plans, but, uh, <laughs> but I will say Austin is definitely a, a nice place. I've visited many times. My brother yeah. lives there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I... So actually, I'm, I happen to be in my third location right now. Which oh, is that's in, right. Uh, you have an, a, a new shop, uh, Delaware, right? Yeah, and it's it's not like fully open yet. Okay. I mean, we're kind of open. We're doing some business out of here, but um, and and I apologize to everybody. I should have apologized earlier for the kind of echo here or whatever. But uh, but it is a new space, and we're you know just kind of rolling with it. And um, and and it, yeah. I'm, but but yeah we're we're in delaware and and yeah we'll see where we go from there um it's uh it's a challenging time these days you know in the in the bike business it's i i feel very fortunate i have no complaints at all you know in that regard but certainly not the easiest time to be like growing and expanding but i do want to continue to you know move in the direction that we we've we've started and and try to help more people get on bikes and and do it in the way that we do it, which seems to be um, appreciated. Uh, I'm, I'm really great, thankful for that. And yeah, but Austin's definitely we, we're missing we're missing the center of the country. Austin could be a good way, or maybe a little bit north of there. I don't know. We'll see. But um, well, yeah, if, you're looking, guess, if you're looking for good, uh, you know, Dutch infrastructure, Dutch inspired infrastructure, uh, you can't do much better than uh, than Austin here. So because you know, th- they do have that 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 level of influence has you know been here. Um, they you know formally you know about ten years ago started really uh, trying to understand what it takes to create an all ages and abilities network and have been you know building that out. So uh, yeah, I'm and in fact I, I reached out to the the bicycle mayor as well from Memoryville and Jonathan and said, Hey, come check it out. <laughs> so. Right. Right. Yeah, I know. That's what he, I, I, so I've been doing a lot of research, listening to a lot of his stuff and this and that. And, you know, and one of the things he says, like a lot of people will say like, Hey, can you come be the mayor of our city or whatever? And right. he said, well, really it's my hope to inspire people just to like, you can do this yourself. And, yeah. and I think that that's a, an excellent message and, uh, and something that we should all really try to encourage as much as possible. It's like, Hey, um, you know, uh, because, because it is possible, but it's just, it, it takes like just trying something new, speaking out, being the outlier. I mean, I've went to some community boards and I was the only one speaking up for, um, you know, active transportation stuff. And, and then w- once you realize like, you know, I mean, unfortunately just most people are followers really, uh, and, and not, they don't have such an easy time, you know, leading out with that stuff. Fortunately, I've been pretty comfortable with that, uh, since the early age, but yeah, I would, I guess it's just a reminder to me to try to remind other people to, you know, speak out sometimes and, you know, yeah, and really, yeah. you know, speak up for what you believe in. You know? yeah. So um, one of the things that you just said uh, reminded me of um, how incredibly powerful it is for people to be able to experience um, a different way of life and a different way of living. 
and the the power of of say getting you know key decision makers politicians um, off on study tours and be able to see what is possible and and that you know points back to a decade plus ago you know where uh, some pol- some of the politicians some of the city leaders did have an opportunity to do a study tour in the Netherlands and be able to uh, e- experience firsthand what that's like and and it really then helps translate to being able to say gosh you know you know, this isn't impossible. People are doing this in other locations. Now you got to tag along with a study tour with my good friend, Meredith Glazer there in Amsterdam. Talk a little bit about that. Cause that, I mean, I've, I've tagged along on her, her tours before as well. And, um, there's, there's something powerful to that, you know, documenting it. Cause that's, I've done that as well as I've documented uh, other study tours over in, in, in the Netherlands. But it's, it's interesting to see the eyeballs sort of get wide and people are like experiencing it and asking really good questions. Cause many of them that are on the study tour aren't experts. They're absorbing and learning and talk a little bit about that. And, and, you know, some of the reflections that you had, uh, sort of, you know, observing it and, and helping document that process. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. Um, I mean, for me, it was really such an honor to be able to go on the tour with her. If you think about it, it's probably something that mostly more, you know, academic types or politicians might go on or whatever, but, um, or legislators, I mean, really, uh, she's such a wealth of knowledge and, and, um, and, and I think she, I, I appreciate that she shares it from being, uh, you know, somebody that's lived, you know, from America being there and helping to understand, you know, how some of these changes could potentially be transferred over. Um, yeah, I, I happened to be able to go the first time with her in 2019. And, and I think initially, w- w- I'm not sure if she was like so sure like whether she'd share the whole video, uh, but I think that it, it got a, a good amount of support. And so she welcomed the idea of doing it the second time. And I'm, I'm really grateful that she did because from my side, you know, it's like, yeah, not everybody necessarily is afforded the opportunity of going on these study tours or, or whatnot or, or able to really understand like why these places are the way they are. And also that like one of the big things is that they haven't always been this way. And uh, a lot of these changes happened more recently. I think that that's probably one of those big ideas that I've been working with a lot lately is that this is not like, it's not like it was always this way. It's not like the Netherlands has been this way since the 1800s or whatever. Like, yeah, people got around on bikes. Like, yeah, sure. And, and, and I mean, in a lot of ways, like New York was a bike city, you know, for, for years and, you know, and cars changed that and it's coming back to it. So yeah, I think just the opportunity to to share those ideas uh, of of what works there and and um, yeah, how how we can transfer that stuff over is is a really big deal. And I think she does an amazing job of that for sure. I, I wish she would share more more content herself. So I know she's done a little bit, but we need to we need to encourage her. Well, she is an academic, so, <laughs> so yeah, and, and I do that's have fair. an upcoming, uh, and I do have a, a, a an episode that I just recorded with her, so it, it'll probably be oh, out before this one, but yeah, that's good stuff. So, uh, Chris, we're coming to the end of our time. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you, you think would be really, really important to leave the audience with? Hmm. Well, um, what have we not talked about? Well, one of the things I think is just this idea that I've been talking or thinking about a lot is just about how bikes uh, lead to more connection. And that really, like, as humans, like, we need to be connected. And um, and you think about, like, other societies that have implemented bikes as a form of transportation, and it seems as though people are a lot happier. And and it's not, and the, the other interesting idea is it's not always necessarily that their lives are easier. I think uh, in America, we're very obsessed with this idea of like making our lives easier and more comfortable, and that's going to be the way to happiness. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's definitely proving not to be the case. Um, but I think, you know, thinking of, as, as biking as a form of connection, as a form of, you know, the, um, you know, 
just random connection that you might have with somebody at uh, waiting at a stop sign or whatever, or, you know, bumping into friends along the ride and, and be able to actually like have some sort of connection with them or even be able to like, you know, just look at someone and like have a facial expression, you know, with them or, you know, just there, there's a lot of value in that. And I think a lot of people miss that. And so I think that's probably, I think we can, we can get caught up sometimes in a lot of the like specific, like, this is the way we apply these principles. This is how we can actually like make this stuff happen. But I think actually understanding, yeah, like, you know, the, the psychology behind it and, and how it impacts us as humans, I think is so critical. And, and I think if we can, I think the better that we can understand that idea you start to really, uh, it, it changes the value dynamic of, you know, biking for transportation or, or making more, you know, active towns and such, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. And, and it's really is a profound observation because uh, it reemphasizes the fact that, you know, when we get out of our, our hermetically sealed metal boxes and, you know, our interacting with people um, more at human scale, human speed, uh, we're able to make those little micro connections, those little micro moments of, of being able to communicate. And it could be just a smile. It could be just some body language. It could be a, a, a slight little wave. And it's one of the reasons too, where I try to emphasize that I'm, I'm a huge fan of electric assist bicycles, um, but I'm not a huge fan of, of speed. I'm not a huge fan of just, you know, going fast for fast sake. Um, for me, it's all about still, um, you know, the life that happens when you're, when you're traveling as, as, as our, our good friend, uh, Chris uh, Brunt likes to say at pedestrian plus, you're going just mm -hmm. a little bit faster. You're still able to connect and communicate, um, with others, but you're also able to connect with the world around you at a much more, um, intimate level. And, and there's a richness that comes from, from that connection. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at there is, uh, yeah, that connections with, with others and in, in, in your surroundings. Yeah, we need it so much. And, you know, especially these days, you know, the pandemic and coming up, you know, like isolation and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, makes you feel a little less like an alien when you could just have some of those interactions. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I, I totally, uh, I totally agree and, and, and dig that you, you know, came up with that and, and, and that was something that you were feeling so profoundly. And, um, I, I, I think it's one of the great opportunities that we have as we get more and more people out on bikes is being able to reestablish that connection. The other thing that uh, in closing, I'll, I'll just say is that you mentioned the fact that, you know, these other countries, uh, whether we're talking about uh, Denmark and Sweden and, and also the, the Netherlands, um, they too went through a, a, a period of time in post-World War II where it was all about the automobile. And their, their rates of cycling went way, way down. And uh, you also mentioned earlier that, you know, the, their populace sort of spoke up and said, no, we, we want to see something different. And, and we want to see, you know, our streets become uh, more people friendly once again, the way that they were prior to the, the automobile really, you know, taking over the space. And so I think that's a hopeful story for all of us in North America and in other cities around the globe that are really car centric now is that, um, you know, Amsterdam wasn't always Amsterdam. The what we see now is is much, much different than what, you know, was in place prior to the automobile and is certainly much different than what was in place when the automobile sort of invaded and took over the streets. And so it was a lot of hard work over the past 50 years to become that all ages and abilities cycling friendly place. And we can do this too. So I believe that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Good stuff. Chris, it has been an absolute pleasure um, having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really uh, quite a pleasure. And it's a, it's a real honor to be on. So thanks again. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 117 with Chris Nolte of Propel Bikes. Please be sure to check out his website and channel. As always, those links are in the show notes and in the description. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this chat. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend and leave a comment down below. 
And if you'd like to have more content like this, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and or podcast. For those of you watching this, just click on the button down below and don't forget to ring the bell and select your notifications preference. Also, please allow me a very brief moment to mention two additional ways that you can help support my efforts. The first, I encourage you to head over to my Active Town store where you can purchase some fun Streets Are For People swag, like this awesome bot water bottle. <laughs> and the second, please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon account by making a modest monthly contribution that fits your budget. I know it may not seem like much, but buying an item or two at the store and or becoming a patron really does help me to keep the momentum of this Active Towns channel and the culture of activity movement rolling along. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide. Well, that's all for this week's episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. All right, pull this thing out of the bushes. <laughs> What are we Let's doing? Go do this. We're gonna go meet Jason from Not Just Bikes. For those of you who don't know, he's got a popular YouTube channel. And it's pretty exciting to meet with him. We're meeting all these like special people of the Netherlands. I feel special that people, special people, want to be special with us. <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I couldn't even hold the camera. This is this is a very special experience. I appreciate you taking your time out at night with us. And, yeah, no problem. Yeah. But uh, we're going to ride south and go through the residential areas and some of the areas that tourists wouldn't get to, and it'll be a little quieter then. But.